Hello my sweeties and welcome back to my channel. If you don't already know me, my name is Elise and thank you for joining my spooky little family. In today's video, we will be talking about the best and not so best horror movies of 2021. Let's get into the video. <laughs> So before we get into my list for today's video, I do just want to have a little chat with you guys and say thanks so much for all of the support that you have given me this year to create all these fun and cool new videos for you guys. I am so happy that you've been enjoying them, especially my horror movies for hot girls segment. And if for some bizarre reason you're not following me on all my socials, Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, all the good stuff. All my links will be in the description box down below. And without further ado, let's get right into the list. At number 10, we have The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, directed by Michael Chavez. The Warrens investigate a murder that may be linked to a demonic possession. So if you've been watching my channel for a little while, then you know that I love The Conjuring movies, and this was one of my most anticipated films of the year, and I will say that I had an absolute blast watching this film. Of course, we have our iconic duo Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga to reprise their role as Ed and Lorraine Warren and they absolutely kill it. I personally really loved this installment because I feel like they kind of decided to go in a new direction for The Conjuring and it wasn't exactly the same formula that they used in The Conjuring 1 and 2 so that was really nice and refreshing to see. I also thought that the film looked really nice. There was a lot of beautiful beautiful cinematography that I really, really loved. Not to mention the possession scene was really cool. And you know what? The Conjuring films are just so much fun, so I am not gonna apologize for liking them. Now on to number nine, we have one that you may have missed this year, and that is The Beta Test, directed by Jim Cummings and PJ McCobb. An engaged Hollywood agent receives a mysterious letter for an anonymous sexual encounter and becomes ensnared in a sinister world of lying, infidelity, and digital data. So you guys probably know Jim Cummings from obviously his cameo in Halloween Kills or for his fabulous work on The Wolf of Snow Hollow, which is one of my favorite creature features. Jim is a super talented director and a great writer. It absolutely shows even more here in the beta test. I will say before somebody comes for me really quick, the beta test is much more of an erotic thriller than it is a full-blown horror film, but if you're into thrillers and mystery kind of films, then I highly recommend checking this one out. I think that it is very well written, and there are a lot of really great shots in this film. They were just doing everything. I honestly just can't wait to see more from Jim Cummings. I'm really excited to see what else he has up his sleeve because he is so talented. I also wanna point out that the beta test was like actually funny. There were some great jokes in this and just overall very good storytelling. Speaking of good storytelling, I know some people are gonna come for me, but at number eight, we have Old, directed by M. Night Shyamalan. A vacationing family discovers that the secluded beach where they're relaxing for a few hours is somehow causing them to age rapidly, reducing their entire lives into a single day. So when this film came out, there were a lot of people making fun of it, thus the meme that was like, let's go to the beach that makes you old. <laughs> I honestly really am a big fan of M. Night Shyamalan, but I was very skeptical going into this film because the trailer did not at all impress me. But you know what? I had an absolute blast with this movie. Now, I do want to say that I think that this film is definitely a little bit ridiculous, but it knows what it is, and that is why I like it. I think this is not only well-written, but it is also very well-acted. We have really great actors in this movie. Alex Wolf, Thomas and Mackenzie, 
and so many others that I can't think of right now. I will say though, if you do not like, you know, M. Night Shyamalan films and you don't like his twists and turns, then you probably are not gonna like this film. He definitely is doing his thing where he has a really ridiculous twist at the end, but I absolutely loved it. I think that this story was effective and they definitely use something that I feel like a lot of people are afraid of, which is, you know, aging and dying. I know I am scared of it. So, I mean, it was just done well. What can I say? Now at number seven, we have Halloween Kills, directed by David Gordon Green. The nightmare isn't over as unstoppable killer Michael Myers escapes from Laurie Strode's trap to continue his ritual bloodbath. Injured and taken to the hospital, Lori fights through the pain as she inspires residents of Haddonfield to rise up against Myers. So again, I know this is one of those films that not so many people liked and they either loved it or hated it, but I absolutely loved it. Like I said in my review of Halloween Kills, this is an action-packed film that is just so much fun. There are, of course, great kills, hence the title of the film. And we get to see a lot of characters from previous films in this one, which was a lot of fun. There were also a lot of Easter eggs to the other Halloween films, which I thought was a lot of fun as well. Also, the opening sequence of this this film is probably my favorite opening sequence of all the films of this year. So thank you, David Gordon Green. Speaking of really fun films, at number six, we have Malignant, directed by James Wan. Madison is paralyzed by shocking visions of grisly murders, and her torment worsens as she discovers that these waking dreams are in fact terrifying realities. I also did a review of Malignant that I will link right up above if you have not seen it. This film was so much fun. We have a great cast here. Annabelle Wallace is obviously the star. She is absolutely amazing in this movie. I'm obsessed with her. I have the biggest crush on her. You guys know the vibes. But I think that James Wan just wanted to make a really fun, silly, ridiculous movie, and he did just that. One thing I really loved about Malignant was a lot of the camera work. There is a gorgeous bird's eye view shot in this movie that I will never shut up about. Not to mention, I think Gabriel is an iconic villain. His murder weapon is absolutely ridiculous and super giallo, so we love to see it. This film is simply worth being on this list just because it was so much fun and it was something that we really needed at this time. Now on to a more serious film that I really loved watching this year at number five, that is Nia DaCosta's Candyman. In present day, many years after the last of the Cabrini Towers were torn down, Anthony and his partner move into a loft in the now gentrified Cabrini. A chance encounter with an old timer exposes Anthony to the true story behind Candyman. Anxious to use these macabre details in his studio as fresh grist for paintings, he unknowingly opens a door to a complex past that unravels his own sanity and unleashes a terrifying wave of violence. I am also gonna plug my review of Candyman real quick above. I really enjoyed this spiritual sequel to Candyman. I think Nia DaCosta is a brilliant director. This film was a lot of fun. There's a lot of really beautiful kills, which sounds like a weird thing to say, but you know what? With this movie, if you've seen it, you know what I mean. Also, Yahya Abdul-Mateen is incredible. Such great casting there. And I just really loved this movie. If you have not seen it yet, I highly recommend you watching it like as soon as possible. Oh my gosh, and now we're getting to some of the baddie movies. I'm so excited. 
At number four, we have The Columnist, directed by Evo Van Art. This film follows a columnist who continuously has to deal with threats and negative comments on her social media pages. One day, she has had enough and decides to hunt down her trolls. So I know when you look up this film, it actually says 2019, but that is because it was released in the Netherlands in 2019, but its US release date was May 2021. This film stars Katja Herbers, who you probably know from the TV series Evil. She is so great in this movie. And did I mention that this is a spooky bad bitch movie? It is. I think this film visually is absolutely gorgeous. I think it is powerful. I think she is powerful. I absolutely love this and cannot recommend it enough. Speaking of super powerful films, at number three, we have The Night House, directed by David Bruckner. A widow begins to uncover her recently deceased husband's disturbing secrets. Rebecca Hall is an absolute queen and she deserves all the praise for this film. This movie was absolutely masterful. Visually, absolutely stunning. Again, some of the camera work here is so good. The message behind this film is so good. It is a very depressing and very dark film. So if that is something that you're not really in the right mind space to deal with right now, I don't recommend checking it out yet. But this is one of those films that it definitely hit me and at moments it was genuinely terrifying in a very realistic way, which I can really appreciate. Now at number two, we have Titan, directed by Julia Docker now. Following a series of unexplained crime, a father is reunited with the son who has been missing for 10 years. So if you have not seen my review of Titan, I absolutely love this film. I think Julia Docker now makes amazing films specifically for women. She just knows how to make films that really connect and speak to me. Much like her first film, Raw, Titan does the same thing. It is so human and just so beautiful. It is like beautiful, but gross. Titan is a body horror, so if you are into body horror films, then you should definitely check this one out. It was very, very good and very effective. Now at number one, this is going to surprise absolutely nobody. It is Last Night in Soho, directed by Edgar Wright. An aspiring fashion designer is mysteriously able to enter the 1960s where she encounters a dazzling wannabe singer. But the glamour is not all it appears to be, and the dreams of the past start to crack and splinter into something darker. This film stars two absolute queens, Anya Taylor-Joy and Thomasin McKenzie. I have been speaking about this film since it was released, and even before it was released when I just saw the trailer, I was on and on and on about how much I already loved it. The trailer sold me. I was like, gonna love this. And went in, came out of the theater, absolutely loved it. I need to see it again. I need to own it. So good. Edgar Wright does not fail. He is a master at his craft. The movie is visually stunning. The story is a lot of fun. And there are a lot of really cool dreamlike sequences that I will never forget. I also really liked that Edgar Wright was inspired by a lot of Giallo films and it absolutely shows and he does it so well. If you want to see two spooky bad bitches killing the game, you need to watch Last Night in Soho. And now let's move on to the not so best horror films of 2021. Oh boy, at number five, we have Aftermath directed by Peter Winter. Desperate to save their marriage, a young couple takes a deal to move into their dream home, but disturbing events reveal the house's troubled history. So Aftermath stars Ashley Green, who you probably know from Twilight, and Sean Ashmore. Now, the issue is not really the casting. Well, 
<laughs> I take that back. Ashley Green and Sean Ashmore are both very talented actors. It's the fact that they clearly do not have any chemistry together. So that already took me out. Another thing that was an issue for me was the camera work in this film. It is absolutely insane, not in a good way. One thing I really hated about this film is the fact that they kept using wide angle lenses. It looked absolutely awful and just kept taking me out. Not to mention the story here is just really bland and lackluster, something that we have seen a million times before. It wasn't at all effective, and if I'm honest, it was just kind of stupid. This film certainly seems more like a Lifetime movie than it does like an actual horror film, but I do know it was released on Netflix and I think is a Netflix original. So maybe that's why it seems like a TV movie, but just like a miss. I also just think that this film was not good at building any type of tension. Just everything was kind of just thrown at you and it's just, it's bad. Speaking of things that are thrown at you and bad, we have at number four, Things Heard and Seen, directed by Shari Springer Berman and Robert Pulsini. An artist relocates to the Hudson Valley and begins to suspect that her marriage has a sinister darkness, one that rivals her new home's history. So this film stars Amanda Seyfried and I love her. So instantly I was like, you know I have to watch this. I also thought it would just be a cool ghost film. I am somebody that I actually do really like supernatural ghost films and this one just, it did not hit. So I will say to its credit that the film visually is really beautiful. There are a lot of really nice shots and the cinematography is really beautiful but that does not take away that the story is so stupid. And when I say stupid, I mean that this story is just really generic and it is a story that we have seen a million times before, especially with ghost stories. So it just wasn't at all refreshing and it was just not good. Not to mention the ending of the film was trash. There was some really awful CGI at the end of the film that really, really took me out. And it just, for this to be a Netflix film, I'm not really sure why the CGI didn't look better. I mean, I don't know what the budget was for this film, but everything else looked great. So I'm not really sure what happened there. Now at number three, we have Seance, directed by Simon Barrett. At an elite boarding school for girls, six friends jokingly engage in a late night ritual, calling forth the spirit of a dead former student who reportedly haunts their halls. Before morning, one of the girls is dead, leaving the others wondering what they may have awakened. So, I have a lot of issues with Seance. I thought that this film was gonna be a lot of fun. I saw a bunch of baddies on the cover and was like, great. Saw Suki Waterhouse and was like, great. Then we had this. My one thing with this film is really, why are we casting Suki Waterhouse to play a teenager? Or are they in college? Or we absolutely need to stop casting like 30 year olds to play young teenagers because Suki Waterhouse, she looks like a grown woman and you cannot convince me that she is like 19 or 20. Not only that, the, oh my God, the story and the plot line for this film was really just ridiculous and it was so obvious. It was just poor storytelling all around. And this film did the one thing that I really hate. They kept playing this really dramatic, really suspenseful music and you think something is gonna happen. 
and nothing happens. Now I will say there is that like kind of cool fight at the end but that cannot save this movie for me. Also, the pacing of this film was absolutely atrocious, and I'll never forget that. Oh boy, at number two, we have False Positive, directed by John Lee. As if getting pregnant weren't complicated enough, Lucy sets out to uncover the unsettling truth about her fertility doctor. Now, I did an entire review of False Positive when it came out, and... I went into this with high hopes, expecting it to be good. I did hear a lot of people say that they liked it, and then I heard some people saying they hated it. But I was like, ooh, a pregnancy horror film? Let's do it. I mean, my favorite horror movie ever is Rosemary's Baby, so I was like, can't wait, love it. But after watching this film, confirm, do not love it. I kind of go into depth in my review of this film why I did not like it, but there were so many things wrong with this movie. I don't even know where to begin. So this film was actually a collaboration between A24 and Hulu, and so I thought it was gonna be great, but it wasn't. There is a lot of fancy camera work here, and it's all for nothing. It's just, all this fancy camera work for absolutely no reason and builds to nothing. Also, there's just a lot of things in the story that were not answered and we weren't sure why these things were happening and they just decided to never explain it, which, okay. The one positive thing I will say about this film is that Pierce Brosnan looked like he had the time of his fucking life playing the villain, and I absolutely loved him. Now at number one, we have The Unholy, directed by Evan Spiliotopoulos. I am pretty sure I said his name incorrectly, and I'm really sorry. A hearing impaired girl is visited by the Virgin Mary and can suddenly hear, speak, and heal the sick as people flock to witness her miracles, terrifying events unfold. The unholy was... I don't know how this was so bad. I really was expecting to like this film. I saw Jeffrey Dean Morgan and was really excited to see him back in a horror movie. And from the trailer, I thought it would be a lot of fun. I love religious horror films. So I thought it'd be right up my alley, but unfortunately, this movie was not very good. The storytelling here is incredibly weak. The editing is really awful. I mean, it is really awful and just, again, super disorienting and didn't really make any sense. I feel like Jeffrey Dean Morgan was kind of phoning it in in this film it seemed as if he wasn't really interested in being a part of this, which was disappointing to say the least. I also wanna say that this film overall, it just looked really bad too. It wasn't at all creative. There was nothing cool going on, no cool camera work and that is all I'm gonna say on that. Now, before I wrap it up here, I do wanna mention two films really quick that came out in 2021 that are not bad. I actually did like these films, but they were just kind of disappointing. First, I will start with The Deep House, directed by Alexandre Bustillo and Julian Mari. A young and modern couple who go to France to explore an underwater house and share their findings on social media undergoes a serious change of plans when the couple enters the interior of a strange house located at the bottom of a lake and their presence awakens a dark spirit that haunts the house. So with The Deep House, I actually thought that this would be right up my alley. When I saw the trailer for this, I was very excited because I feel like this idea was just so original and so fun. To have a found footage horror film all done underwater was absolutely brilliant and I do want to give credit where credit is due. Visually, it was beautiful, and the fact that they did all of this underwater 
is absolutely amazing. My only issue with this film is that the ending was incredibly underwhelming and I really, really wanted more. I feel like there were a lot of really cool, fun ideas and there were moments that it was really creepy, but then it just never got to where it should have went. This film could have went on to being two hours and I would have been fine with it because I just wanted them to give us more. And I feel super similar to the next film and that is Antlers, directed by Scott Cooper. In an isolated Oregon town, a middle school teacher and her sheriff brother become embroiled with her enigmatic student whose dark secrets lead to terrifying encounters with an ancestral creature. So I have just come to terms with the fact that there will never be a good horror film about a Wendigo. <laughs> That's it. Antlers visually was very beautiful. And I will say I love Jesse Plemons. I was really happy to see him in a horror film this year. I think Carrie Russell did a fine job. She was good. Unfortunately, I feel like this film definitely suffers from, again, a very underwhelming ending and it kind of just does nothing. I will say though, there are a lot of things about this movie that are cool and a lot of things that were eerie and creepy that did work. So I'm not at all trying to bash the film. I think it was decent. I just wanted, again, I wanted more. And I really wanted more about the Wendigo. I just wanted more of this story. Instead, I feel like we focused a lot on the drama between the two siblings. And it just, it just didn't work for me. All right, you guys, that is it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe as it really helps me a lot. And be sure to click that little notification bell to be up to date every single time I upload. And please let me know in the comments what were some of your favorite watches for 2021 and which ones were you not so crazy about? I'd love to talk about it. Don't forget to check out all my other socials in the description box as well as my Patreon page. I have a lot of fun perks and we have lots of fun on our Discord chat and during our movie watch parties. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.